Hello. Hello. Hi. How are you? Okay. Good Thank to you see for you. having me. Thank you. Okay, we start with the most important subject in the world. Maybe, maybe before course... you, maybe before we start with the subject, you can tell us a bit about yourself and so on. Oh, okay. I'm Malka. I uh, I'm a Malka Spector. I'm a sex therapist and mainly actually family therapist. I graduated at uh, Tel Aviv University, my first degree at uh, UNC, and um, more, mainly um, I deal with sexuality, not only sex, but sexuality, and I uh, live near Jerusalem and I also uh, work online, but the main um, thing is that I deal with sexuality, but I'm all confused because nobody can answer the real, real um, burning questions about making love, making, having sex nowadays, not only the pandemic, not only the war, the last uh, 20, 20 years uh, that I, since I started, um, the last 15 years, I see no sex uh, among uh, married people and even less among non-married people. And I'm really confused. So I turned to you and I asked, what, what do you think about the whole thing? Is there any future to sexuality among married people? What's going on, Sam? Sex is a, a mode of communication. It's a language. And it is therefore predicated, it is the outcome or the derivative of the need to communicate, the need to talk to each other. You can talk to each other using words, you can talk to each other using your body. But we live in an age of atomization, an age where people pr prefer loneliness and singlehood to intimacy and couplehood. People regard any interpersonal relationship with someone else as a burden a problem, a difficulty, or even a threat. So there is, there are declining incentives to be in touch with each other, declining incentives to talk to each other or to listen to each other, declining incentives to socialize with each other. And of course, consequently, declining incentives to have sex. Sex is, uh, sex has two components, as, as you well know. It has the bodily component, the physiological component. And in this sense, sex is just the gratification of an arousal. But it, in the case of human beings, at least, it has another component, which is possibly much more relevant and much more, much more weighty than the physiological one. And that's a psychological component. That's why we use the term psychosexuality rather than sex. And when people, when the psychology of people change, changes, when people withdraw from each other, avoid each other, when people put boundaries and distances and, and isolate themselves, when 42% of the adult population in industrialized nations choose to be lifelong single, when among the young under age 25, the frequency of, of uh, sex has been declining dramatically because they are incapable of having intimacy. And they're incapable of having intimacy because they've never been brought up to be intimate with each other and because of economic considerations. Mm -hmm. They can't, for example, rent an apartment and have a private space. That's right. So there are no incentives, not only in the, on the individual level, but also on the social economic level, socioeconomic level, and on the environmental level. And so the physiological part can be easily gratified via pornography. Pornography provides arousal. The cost of pornography is infinitely small, zero in effect. And the risks attendant upon pornography are much, much less, much more reduced compared to the risks of interacting with another human being nowadays. It's a risky proposition today to be in contact with another person, a risky proposition. It's dangerous territory. And so 
people have been avoiding each other on, on multiple levels and sex is no exception. Now, physiologically speaking, our brains, and especially male brains, by the way, <clears throat> this is true mostly about when, when it comes to male brains. Male brains cannot tell the difference between visuals and actual experience. The male brain reacts to pornography identically to having real sex. That has been established in functional magnetic resonance imaging studies and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Men are not able to tell the difference on the primitive level, on the brain level. They are not able to tell the difference between pornography and a real life partner. So the arousal physiological part is 100% gratified with men. They don't need women for this. I know. And women, women have never been focused on the sexual aspect, on the physiological aspect. Women have always regarded the whole thing as a package deal. Even in a one night stand, a woman expected some kind of connection. That's right. Some kind of emotional resonance or gratification, however minimal, however minimal. And so both, both genders or both sexes, there's a big difference between sex and gender, but both sexes and both mm -hmm. genders. Mm -hmm today are self-sufficient. The men are self-sufficient because they have access, unlimited, unmitigated access to pornography of the highest quality and order. And so they are aroused and they orgasm without any need for a real life partner. And women uh, are disincentivized and they don't need men because men are not offering the, the complete package. That's right. Men are highly focused on physiological bodily gratification. Men are not offering today emotions or intimacy or connectivity. It's all very mechanical. It's all very genitalia oriented. It's all very kinky in the best case. Yes. And that's it. It's And this is not something women are interested in. So men are offering what women are not interested in. I need some hope. I, I, I need some words of hope. I'm serious because the last time, uh, the last thing that I really, I, I was shocked and I want to tell you, maybe someone will benefit from it. A couple came to me and they have four kids, beautiful kids. And I talked to them about their sexuality and it turns out they did it not by um, penetration and they're married. He couldn't penetrate to her, in her, because he just couldn't. He he had to ejaculate into a mavchena, um, and uh, then he. Uh, um, I mean, uh, isn't that shocking? And I'm talking to you about real life stories, and and I'm 67, and it still shocks me to see how far pornography influences our brain. I mean, he loves her. He loves her so much. The Madonna, um, which um, Madonna horror complex, he loves her so much, but he cannot penetrate into her. Four kids. And now, now I have to, I really am on a journey to find out what's going on. How can we a little bit reverse it? Just a little bit. Well, we have, definitely, we have definitely transitioned from in operational, in the operational sense, yes. we have definitely transitioned from sex to or full-fledged sex or partner sex to masturbation. Exactly. Masturbation is the main mode of sexual activity nowadays. Yes, it is. And even when you are with a sexual partner, you're yes. masturbating with a sexual partner's body. Yes. It's still masturbation. So self-gratification is known in psychology as uh, autoerotism. Autoerotism is when you consider your own body or yourself as the main and sometimes the only, the sole, the exclusive sexual object. You're attracted to yourself, actually. Exactly. And you're attracted to yourself either alone, when you're alone, 
face mm -hmm. face with pornography or fantasy or imagination or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you could also be attracted to yourself via the agency of a partner. Her gaze, her gaze. Yeah. The very fact that she's attracted to you, the very fact she finds you irresistible, the very mm -hmm. fact she wants to have sex with you, is enough to arouse you and to to make you your own sexual object. Because you see yourself through another person's eyes. And what you see in that other person's eyes is how attractive you are. And yes. so you're attracted to yourself. And so there is a, a tidal wave, there's a tsunami of autoerotism, yes. masturbatory activities, and so on and so forth. And even when there is some form of interaction between partners, sexual partners, the partner is objectified and commodified. So, for example, the two most prevalent sexual practices nowadays are choking and anal sex. Vaginal sex is in the third place. If if not more than that, even. Yes. Even more, well, less. Vaginal, less. Vag vaginal sex almost disappeared, and today it's anal. Yes. Today it's anal and, and uh, choking. Both anal and choking involve the objectification of the partner, treating the partner as a, a dildo, animated sex doll, um, and objectifying the partner in the sense that the partner is treated as, as an object. Now, in an age of rising narcissism, now what is narcissism? Narcissism is when we are sexually attracted to ourselves. By the way, this is the original definition of narcissism. The first person to describe Narcissism was Sigmund Freud. Yes. And Sigmund Freud in 1914, when he discussed Narcissism, he was talking about sexual self-attraction. That was the original definition of Narcissism. Today it's not, but at the time it was. That's right. So in an age of Narcissism, we make love to ourselves. Sometimes through the mediation and agency of another person, but still, we make love to ourselves and to no one else. And the second thing is, we treat everyone as a tool of gratification, an object, a device, a gadget, everyone. We ignore, we dehumanize the partner. We no longer see the human dimension. And so there's no need for any ulterior communication. The only need is actually two bodies. And using the partner's body to, to masturbate. Now, this is, of course, as you said repeatedly, this is definitely a reflection of pornography. This is exactly what happens in pornography. You don't know the names of the people. You don't, know, you don't have any background. They don't have a personal history. They come out of nowhere. There's no context. It's just bodies clashing. And usually everyone in, in pornography is actually masturbating with other people's bodies. It's a masturbatory industry. It's not about sex. There's no sex in pornography. That is a myth. There's masturbation, sometimes using instruments, sometimes using people, but it's masturbation. Exactly. The thing is this. Exactly. The thing is this. Pornography is well suited to the age of narcissism. In other words, it's not an accident that pornography has exploded exactly now. There's always been pornography. You can find pornography in Pompeii, in the ruins of Pompeii on the walls. You see pornographic paintings. Pornography has always been with us. Yes. But it was nowhere near as prevalent, ubiquitous, and all important as it is today. Because today, pornography is the dominant form of sexual education. Studies, yes, is, studies is, in the United is. States, in other countries, show, have shown that young people under the age of uh, 25 acquire most of their knowledge about sex from pornography mm -hmm. and from peers, and the peers got their knowledge from pornography. From pornography, yes. So pornography is, is the number one sex educator in the world. It is true. But it is so successful because it teaches people to function in a highly narcissistic, dehumanizing society. So pornography is the right kind of sex in, in the postmodern world. This is, this is the big mistake of sex educators and no mm -hmm. offense, sexologists. Yes, no problem. 
attack pornography. They say pornography yes. is bad. It teaches young people uh, bad sexual practices. It, it's that's not true. Pornography teaches young people exactly what they need to know in a world that is cold, hostile, narcissistic, mm -hmm. selfish, dehumanizing, and objectifying. I understand. I understand. I agree with you. Unfortunately, when you need to learn as a young person how to conduct sex in such a world, mm -hmm. you are much better off learning from pornography than from anything else. So, this is this is the role of pornography, and it, we have we all have um, uh, sexual scripts. Yes, sexual scripts teach us how to behave in a variety of sexual settings and and circumstances, but. Mm -hmm. How do you how do you apply sexual scripts when, for example, sex is fluid? The sex, I mean, male, female, yes. binary, yes. non-binary. Yes. How yes. do you apply sexual scripts to this? I don't how know. Do you apply yeah. sexual scripts when behaviors are fluid, when morality is fluid, when mm -hmm. when everything is in flux. In flux. Sexual scripts are useless. You have to learn on the fly. You have to improvise all the time. You have to negotiate each meeting and each transaction from zero, from the beginning. There's no guidance. There are no rules. You meet a person. You both want to have sex. You have to talk about it. You have to analyze it. You have to agree on ground rules, consent, enthusiastic, not enthusiastic. It becomes a lawyerly. It becomes <laughs> like a legal. And it's like a court. You're going to court. <laughs> So Unfortunately, sex, it's true. Sex is becoming repulsive also. It's becoming repulsive because the period preceding the sex sounds like two lawyers negotiating. You know? <laughs> and if you get it wrong, uh -oh. if you get it wrong, that's sexual assault. That's right. I know, I know all about you it. May, you may end up destroying your life. So I know, it's true. It's true. And women really, I have to say, no, I'm not trying to say it. I'm not ashamed. Women use this very much even here in israel they use it they use it to get money to get fame to get to be corbanot to be victims no problem i mean people use it and women use it and i'm a woman and i can say it's true i need some hope but um not only that i need hope i think there is hope the hope is as you say in many of your uh, lectures first of all to accept life and reality as is first we accept that that's 2024 2025 almost and that's life that's reality so fighting with reality is, is not good for us right but some of the hope i see is that um i have to say i have to i have to uh, confess that my son is religious i know i know your, your feelings about religion my son is religious he has eight kids no one of his kids has smartphone and i'm completely sure completely sure that even when they get to get to see pornography they won't be 12 years old they will be maybe 25 years old which is also the age that you say, and it's true that our brain is, is adult finally. But I feel that um, there's hope in that we can, we don't have to give kids, all of them, including religious kids like my grandchildren, smartphones. We really don't have to. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the law. We don't, I think we start, it's okay. We are, we are okay. But, if you are 10 years old now here in Israel or in America or in Macedonia, whatever, you don't have to give children smartphones. I think, I think it's possible. Let's say if you're really poor, no smartphone. If you are really religious, like my son is, no smartphone for the kids. For him, it's okay. So I think the hope is maybe we can learn from people who are innocent in that they discover that he, they can be innocent and unless i mean until the what 22 23 when they st the, you know the religious people are getting married when they're 22 23 i think it's a trick it's a solution it's a small solution 
But I really need more hope because I think there is hope and, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes. There is some hope, some hope, because I think, um, I mean, I'm I'm happily married, but I I feel that I'm I'm almost feel um, pity for people who are getting married now because within one year that's it, I, no excitement, nothing. Fewer and fewer. Back to um, back to fewer. pornography, and they do. Fewer and fewer. Six months fewer. after the marriage, and three months after the 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 marriage ceremony, they go to a porn hub, porn hub. Porn hub, right? It's amazing. So, to tell the truth, between this and being being poor or very religious, I take the religious. Why not? Because they're pure in their thinking, and they you know, they think about good things, and they don't have to be exposed to pornography in the age of eight. What are your thoughts about it? <laughs> I don't believe in I don't believe in curing one problem by introducing another i, I see i regard okay. religion as a delusional disorder so. I, I i asked i asked the wrong right the wrong person about religion i, but know I, I agree well, that i agree that we are not completely helpless um okay for example the reason pornography has become the number one sex education venue is mm -hmm. that we do not provide sex education mm -hmm. we do not provide sex education definitely in countries like the united states where sex mm -hmm. education is proscribed. And when we do provide sex education, we focus on anatomy, mostly. Mostly anatomy. That's right, that's right. And so we refuse, I think, I think adults are afraid to tackle the, the topic. They are afraid to talk to that's children. That's right, that's right, that's so, right, that's right. So I think if we were to provide sex education, that would be a very important step, at least to counter the misinformation coming out of pornography. That's right. That's right. Sim uh, yeah. Second thing yeah. is, second thing is, we don't have good role models. That's right. For example, masculinity. It's very difficult for a young boy to learn how to become a man. That's because right. Because there are no good role models of masculinity, so you end up with the likes of Andrew Tate or worse, who teach young boys, and even Jordan Peterson, who teach young boys to be toxic, toxic men. He does. I don't know enough about him. He does. In, in his own subtle way. Andrew Tate, he... is much more, Andrew Tate is much more open about it. Okay. So, when you don't have role models, okay. people like Andrew Tate and even Jordan Peterson will become your role models because you are at a loss. Now, when you look around you, the adults are failing. They're failing That's in their relationships. Right. They're failing in their sexuality. They're... Who would you emulate? Who would you imitate? Who That's would... right. That so is today, very today, true. Today there's that a huge vacuum. Very true. Today there's a huge. Uh... Let's establish a protocol. When I finish yes. talking, you start talking. Yes. Okay. Okay. It's very disruptive. It's very hard for me, but thank you. Thank you. So, uh, in the absence of role models and in the absence of proper education, not only about sex, but about intimacy, about relationships, about growing up, about becoming an adult, about uh, adult chores and responsibilities, about social functioning, sexual spread. So, all this is missing. There's not one country in the world, and that includes countries like Sweden. There's not one country in the world which gives children what they need in order to become functioning, happy adults. So I blame the education system. Mostly. Not only Holland, uh, Netherlands, the Netherlands? No. No? Because in the Netherlands, what you get is you get 10% of the equation. You get the hyper-liberal, progressive vision mm -hmm. or version of sex, which which doesn't reflect, absolutely does not reflect, the overwhelming vast majority of the population. So... What do you mean, wait, I didn't understand. What do you mean, 10%? Um, in, in the Netherlands, you get a kind of sex education that is woke. Okay. Sex, edu sex education that ah, is okay. liberal, hyper-progressive. Okay, okay, okay. And 90% of the population on Earth 
don't agree with these values. These are not the values of 90% of the population on Earth. And so imposing this agenda on people is not sex education, as far as I'm concerned. It does not prepare them for life. Um, knowing, learning uh, about transgender and about uh, homosexuality you know, is very important, of course. But when this becomes the core syllabus, <laughs> when this becomes the only thing you teach, then it's, it's a problem. And that's the case in, in Poland. I'm sorry to oh. say. Wow. So there's nothing balanced. There's no introduction of children into adulthood. Induction, process called induction. There's no induction. So children go where they can. They go to peers, they go to pornography, they go to Andrew Tate, they go to Jordan Peterson, they, they go wherever they can. <laughs> You're so entertaining, I have to say. I have to say. So, Sam, is there any future for marriage? Between me and you, nobody listens. I mean, marriage, come on. What's for? I mean, children we can do with other ways. Me, women, you know, found out about it. What? What's marriage for, really? Marriage is mostly about companionship mm -hmm. and the allocation of economic resources, wealth, accumulated wealth and so on and passing it on to the next generation. Now, technically marriage is indeed not needed, as you said. You can have children outside marriage, you can have companionship outside marriage, you can have friendship outside, you can have sex outside. I mean, marriage today is not a framework that provides on the face of it, any value added. What's the value added in marriage? It's just burdensome and so on. But that's exactly the value added of marriage. Marriage makes it more difficult to break up. Okay. The only, the only indispensable function of marriage, the only function you cannot find outside marriage, is that marriage makes it difficult to break up. Forces you to consider, forces you to think, forces you to try again. Force, marriage forces you to not act. To grow up. So, to grow up, exactly. To not act right. impulsively and petulantly. And, because the penalties, if you act stupidly and, mm -hmm. and immaturely, the penalties are huge. So you can find sex outside marriage, companionship, you name it. You can find everything outside marriage. Even children, even when you're alone with no partner, you can have children. Everything you can find outside marriage. The only thing you cannot find outside marriage is commitment, true commitment. Mm -hmm. Because true commitment goes not only with rewards and benefits. True commitment goes with punishments, with sanctions. Mm -hmm. If When I want you to be truly committed to someone, I will tell you what good things you will get if you're committed, what good outcomes you will have if you mm -hmm. remain committed. But I will also tell you what will happen if you break your word, if you break your promise, if you walk away, if you're immature, if you're not serious, if you're narcissistic, if you're too narcissistic. Yes. So marriage is a mature, non-narcissistic institution, which is exactly why it is in decline. <laughs> wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. So... You say something amazing. Marriage is sort of the the medicine for narcissistic age, for the narcissistic age or the narcissistic person, because it's gvulot, it's borders, it's, um, it's limitations, and we need limitations. We need borders. We need uh, stop signs. Wow, wow, that's new. And we need punishments. When you establish a boundary. When uh -huh. I establish a boundary, when I told you a few yes. minutes ago, for example, yes. I told you, please yes. don't talk when I talk. Yes. That's a boundary. Uh -huh. But when I establish a boundary, it's clear that if you break this boundary, there will be consequences. And so this is a minor boundary, not very important, and the consequences will not be very important. Maybe I will be, again, impolite and unpleasant. But if, if the boundary is 
we should have children together, we should have a future together, we should, we should not betray each other, then of course the punishment is also very big, commensurately big. And this is a great description of marriage. Marriage is a list of boundaries coupled with expectations and planning and penalties if you betray, if you break promises. Penalties, definitely. That's why people avoid marriage. Because people today are children, they're immature and they're narcissistic and they don't want to be penalized. They don't want to bear the consequences of their actions and choices and decisions. And it's not only marriage. All structures are falling apart, not only marriage. Whole countries are falling apart, nations. You see it in nations. Israel is a great example. You see you see these dynamics, not only in families, but in all institutions, in, in higher education, in nations, in, in church, in wherever you go, you see this loosening of commitment, this disinvestment, this refusal to pay the price for wrong choices, mistaken decisions, and misbehavior. So, of course, okay. if you get married. <laughs> well, I always say to women, do not live without marriage. You know why? Because legally, a woman in Israel, and in other places too, but specifically in Israel, if she's getting married, if she's married, she's better off economically when she's not married, when she divorces. So that's that's a good patent. That's a good uh, thing. It's better to be married for a woman in Israel in other places because it protects her rights economically and also socially. So you cannot say to a woman, just go and go to the river. Now, I, I'm getting just, a little just a comment hope, on this. hopeful. What just do you say? Comment, just a, to comment on what you said. Please. Please. In the majority of Western countries, it doesn't matter if you're married or not, you have the same rights after five years together, five, three to five years together. So it doesn't matter if you're married or not. Actually, studies have shown that men benefit from marriage. Uh, men who are married live longer and they're much healthier. However, women are vulnerable during yes. the period of raising children. Yes. There's a vulnerability, economic vulnerability, physical vulnerability, and so on and so forth. So the protector and provider function of the main, of the male, of the men, is still there. Never mind how much nonsense liberals and progressive would tell you that it's not true. Women are totally independent and autonomous and can do whatever they want. They don't need men. They oh, hate men. Yeah. They are against men. Um, pat patriarchy and hegemony and all these beautiful words. The truth is that during the lifespan, there are periods where the woman is vulnerable and needs the man, and there are periods where the man is vulnerable and needs the woman. For example, after age 65 or 70, yes. men usually rely on women for medical care and, and companionship and so on. And then the, the power matrix is reversed. The woman is in control. The woman is in charge. Mm -hmm. so, the lifespan is a. Oh, I don't like the word control. What do you say? Uh, please, is is there a word, another word? Because we are not controlling each other. It's really a question of power uh, and economics. It's not control anymore. It's in since theory. The 60s, it's not in control. In theory, anymore. yes. In theory, it's it's a balance of needs and, and needs. expectations and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. But there, within couples there is always a dynamic of power within couples. So hmm. there's always a, a oh. they always power. contest, contest power. The, there's a power play. Power. Oh. Couples, yes. You're right, you're right, you're right. I agree, I agree. Um, so there is a little hope and I feel, um, I feel there, there's hope coming from your words because if people will know that boundaries are good for you, actually it's good for you. As you say, uh, men are benefiting from marriage, yes, psychologically, so. emotionally, medically, whatever. But it is 70%, but 70% of divorces are initiated by women. That's right. That's right. I agree. All over the world, all yeah. over the world, especially the Western world, of course. Uh, so there is a little hope about marriage. 
And I wanted to talk to you about something that's new, I think, in your life. And it's very important and it's very, I'm very curious about it. Finally, uh, you came out with therapy. And I'm I'm looking, I'm, I want to hear all about it with best, I mean, without any shine, don't be shy. Because I think it's about time that you, after 25 years that you're in the business, more than 25 years, you should help in you and your wife's uh, way because we need we need we need you in that way not only theoretically but also as a therapist or 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 influencing therapist or influencing counselors because by the way what's the difference between counselor and therapist for other people who don't know i know it you know it what's the difference a well, counselor a counselor is someone who provides uh, mental health advice and and support without uh, a license and without having a formal training or education in the field. Mm -hmm. So anyone essentially could be a counselor in exactly. some, countries, exactly. some countries. There are very few countries now where you need to have a license even to be a counselor, but the majority, no, you can be a counselor, a coach. It's exactly like a coach. coach. In many countries, you could be a coach without any formal training and licensing, mm -hmm. with one or two exceptions. I think in the United Kingdom, you already need to have a license. Um, a therapist, which I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I know. A therapist or a clinician, clinician is, is a wider definition. It includes therapist, licensed social worker, and so on. Mm -hmm. A therapist is someone who, who provides treatment, not advice. But, but provides treatment. Treatment is a, um, a fancy word for manipulation. A therapist <laughs> manipulates your mind. I like it. And for good reason. He wants to help you. Yes. But he does manipulate your mind. He knows yes. the ins and outs of your mind. He knows yes. which buttons to push, when. He knows to provide you with outcomes, such as insight. So, and then... To do this, he needs to have formal education. He needs to have supervision. In other words, therapists go to other therapists uh, and he, uh, on a regular basis. And he needs to, um, he needs to conform uh, to certain legal demands, including licensing. And so. Yes. so therapist is much more rigorous. Is much more. Even, even a clinical psychologist is not as regulated as a therapist. And oh, a professor, mean, a professor of psychology mean? like me is not regulated at all. That's right. No. Thank God, thank God, because you can help. It's okay. It's okay with me. Um, but you took many years, at least seven, sometimes you say seven, sometimes you say ten. I believe that you you thought about how to help people, leave the word therapy aside, how to help those narcissists, narcissists. how to help people who are really they don't really know who to go to actually people come to me and they, they just don't know who to go to they just don't know what are the words to look at google really as you as you know dana really talked about it people believe anything they don't really know who to turn to so there is there are people who can you can turn to and at least ask them who to turn to they can ask me they can ask you because not everybody is suited to uh therapy or to counseling but what uh how do you describe your work in that uh in that matter before i uh, call therapy they call therapy yes before i describe my work there is a major problem because there are many people especially online yes who present themselves as experts on narcissism for example and they're not. That someone has a doctorate in psychology doesn't make them an expert on narcissism. That's right. Psychology is a giant field. Actually, psychology is the biggest field in... Uh, oh, yeah? I'm a physicist by training. I have a PhD. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, physics, you are a physicist is nothing by training. physics is nothing compared to psychology. Psychology wow. is hundreds of times bigger. Wow. So if you are an expert on something in psychology, it doesn't mean that you're an expert on everything in psychology. Oh, yes, you're right. Yes. There are many, many charlatans, corn artists, um, nochlim in Hebrew. Nochlim. 
who present themselves as experts on narcissism spew nonsense and misinformation in contradiction of everything we learn and know. And unfortunately, they're very, very popular. Popular? That's a, that's a major, major problem. Major problem. Because people, when they go online, the first people they come across are these con artists and dilettantes, wow. charlatans. The first. And usually they're lost also. So they get wrong information and they end up spending a fortune. These people, of course, charge a lot of money and so on. They end up spending a fortune. It's a whole industry that because it's not regulated that is essentially a crime syndicate. It has become a crime syndicate. There's no other way to describe it. And they collaborate with each other as well. They, they do? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, they do. There are networks of them, yeah. Okay. So this is... Uh, general observation about uh, regarding my work my work has two facets there is uh, a series of techniques and so on and so forth that i've developed to to help victims of narcissistic abuse mm -hmm. these techniques are fully available free of charge on my youtube channel there is a playlist called, uh, titled narcissistic abuse healing and recovery okay and you can find there are more than 100 techniques how to help yourself when you have been, or you think you have been, the victim of narcissistic abuse. Some of these techniques are good in any case. Some of these techniques are developed, some of them are mine, proprietary, and some, and but most of them are common knowledge. And then the second thing I've done, I came up with a suggested treatment modality for people with narcissistic personality disorder. Now, again, I'm not a therapist. And so I've had to train therapists in order to administer. The treatment modality consists of two, three important insights. Number one, narcissists are not adults, they're children. So we need to use techniques from child psychology. Number two, narcissism is not only a personality disorder, it's a post-traumatic condition. So we need to use trauma therapies Number three, narcissistic defenses are so powerful that the only way to break through is by re-traumatizing the narcissist, forcing the narcissist to experience trauma yet again. By the way, that's not yeah, some that's, the that's not Sorry. some name that is Sigmund Freud, that is Noah, that is uh, um, uh, uh, there are numerous scholars that came up with the same insight. It's nothing new. It's just that I put it together with techniques from trauma and techniques from child psychology. This is really in a nutshell because I give I give week long semin two week long seminars. Oh, two weeks long. So this is this is really in a nutshell. But these insights are are very unusual in the field because all the other treatment modalities, all the other therapies, they relate to the narcissist as if this is some kind of adult. They negotiate with the narcissist, they bargain with the narcissist, it's as if it's an adult, when the narcissist is actually a child. All other treatment modalities ignore the traumatic element in pathological narcissism. It's a catastrophic mistake. This narcissism is 80% trauma. You know, And all the other treatment modalities tiptoe around the trauma. They, they don't dare to challenge the narcissist, to confront the narcissist, because they're afraid of the narcissist, honestly. You know? So they don't, they kind of uh, hands off, you know? They talk, putsi mutsi, as we say. You know, <laughs> that's not the way. Interesting. That's not the way. You have to, to confront the narcissist head on, traumatize him, break that's his... The big, that's the big thing that uh, scares you know our our ears even my ears even though i looked into it and it, you, it's okay but it scares our ears to hear re-traumatized so maybe you can i know it's hard but maybe you can give a little example it's all Re verbal you said it's all verbal it's all no verbal. talk no re-traumatization uh, yeah, re is a set is a series of uh, techniques um and again, many of these techniques, I always like to give credit where it's due. Many yes, of these techniques yes. were developed very early on by Breuer and Freud and so on. And most notably by Foa and Nozak. 
these are two. Well, Edna Foa, Dr. Edna Foa. You know, it's your transcript I read, yeah. and her word, her name is not spelled right. I have to say, I looked into it, and ah, Edna Foa, okay, she's an expert, a world-known expert, Ed, Dr. Edna Foa. It's not good in your transcript, mm -hmm. uh, whoever wants to read your... The transcript is, ge is generated by artificial intelligence. So I know. Okay, so... It's Edna FOA, F-O-A, F-O-A. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, re-traumatization is a set of verbal techniques. Of verbal. course, there's no physical contact of any kind, shape, or form, directly or indirectly. Actually, in cold therapy, all physical contact is forbidden. It's forbidden. Because physical That's contact uh, provides comfort, soothing. Ah, okay, okay. It's the opposite of humanistic psychology. In humanistic okay. psychology, we encourage physical contact. In cold therapy, the therapist is not the friend of the narcissist. To, good to say it. You should so say it. Even handshake is forbidden. don't understand that. Even okay. handshake is forbidden because... When you shake hands with the narcissist, it's like your friend. <laughs> yes. Like, no no borders, no limitations. Yes, no boundaries. No, so no boundaries. Physical no. contact is absolutely forbidden and it's totally verbal. The verbal techniques, when you put them together, force the narcissist to re experience not the trauma itself, because the trauma is usually physical. There's beating, yes. incest, rape. I don't know. Of course, yes. you cannot re experience this but forces the narcissist to re-experience his or her reaction to the trauma. Okay. So this, this is known as vividness or revividness. It's, uh, it's essentially artificial flashback. It's like inducing artificial flashback, triggering the narcissist, if you wish. Triggering the narcissist to re-experience the trauma internally, not externally. Internally. Now, People who are not therapists or who are not same vaccine do not understand that that's why i wanted you to me to 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 say plainly simply if you had a mother who used to abuse you and uh, and uh, verbally put you down and criticize you all the time and so on and so forth and you became a narcissist it's a typical defense against childhood early childhood abuse it's a very traumatic experience could be a very traumatic experience, depending on the intensity and the... And then you come to cold therapy. And in cold therapy, what the therapist would do, not me, I'm not therapist, but the therapist would do, the therapist would find out what your mother used to say to you and recreate the verbal abuse. Recreate the verbal abuse, not externally. It's not that the therapist will abuse you. <laughs> it will not... The therapist is not, will not become your mother and abuse you again. But the what? therapist would force you to remember this yes. abuse. Mm -hmm. Would trigger you. Internal, the internal experience of facing your mother, who is now abusing you, will be recreated. A flashback, simply. So it's, if you want to boil down cold therapy, it's artificial flashback therapy. Now, this is not recommended to anyone, definitely not to any trauma victim, not to, absolutely to no kind of patient, except patients diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder and no comorbidity. Okay. In other words, if, if there is someone with narcissistic personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, this kind of person should never have cold therapy. Definitely borderline should never have cold therapy. Bipolar, I mean, only pure, unadulterated narcissists should have cold therapy. And, uh, and cold therapy is very limited in its effects. What cold therapy does, it gets, re gets rid of the need for narcissistic supply, for attention. Okay. Because it, cre it creates internal regulation of the sense of self-worth. So mm -hmm. you don't need supply anymore. And because you don't need supply anymore, there's no need for the false self, and the false self disappears. Okay. And so this is what cold therapy does. It doesn't change the narcissist. It's not that the narcissist becomes a nice person, kind person, empathic person, no empathy. Everything else remains the same. He's obnoxious, he's unpleasant, he's, I mean, you name it. There's no change in the narcissist, except the narcissist no longer has a false self, and he doesn't need narcissistic supply anymore. Wait a second. 
you say yourself that uh, it's known, it's known all over, you know, for the last eight years that um, you said it yourself very interestingly that narcissists were not the paid, they don't come to therapy, they just don't come. Unless they are in jail or war, uh, Chevy, war uh, hostage, and uh, and they change their. You said uh, that they change their personality once they are in conflict, right? Like what? Uh, so how how do you how do you, how do you think they should? Why should they come? Why should they no, come? To we should we should come? not confuse the two issues. Narcissists do do come to therapy they if do? They, if they hit rock bottom. Ah, if okay. they lost if they've lost everything, family, money, position, freedom, okay. they've lost everything. Okay. They're likely to come to therapy, but they come to therapy because they want to restore. They exactly. Want to restore their, exactly. Exactly. But still, but still they are there. Once they're ah. inside the the therapist's office in the clinic, you can begin to work with them. However, when a narcissist is Find, finds himself in an environment that is highly boundary, rule-based environment, dangerous, life life threatening. Yes. And so on. The narcissistic behaviors disappear. The narcissist behavior changes so dramatically that it would be difficult to diagnose that person with narcissistic personality. Exactly. Exactly. This is exactly the insight of cold therapy. Cold therapy creates this condition. Cold therapy is exactly like putting the narcissist in prison or in, in a life-threatening situation. You know? Because this kind of environment is traumatizing. And because pathological narcissism is the outcome of trauma, invariably, there's not a single case. Yes. In all the backgrounds of narcissism, there is adverse childhood experiences. Yes. So, because it's a post-traumatic condition, when you put a narcissist in prison, that is trauma. That is re-traumatization. That mm -hmm. is called therapy. It that is, is called therapy. Exactly. Wait a second. But why then, should a man come, come to you and pay you for this experience? He doesn't want... And as you said, as if he... If he hits a rock bottom, he does. Okay. But I know it from therapy in sex therapy and family therapy. People just don't come back. They come, they come twice, and that's it. Why? Because they don't want to change. Why should they there change? Is a, it's a very good question. There is a paradox in narcissism. Yes. The paradox is this. The narcissist is an addict. It's an addictive yes. personality. He's addicted to narcissistic supply. He's addicted to attention. On the one hand, he's addicted to attention. On the other hand, it's very humiliating. It's very shameful to be dependent on other people. The narcissist re resents, he's very angry that he's so, so helpless that he needs narcissistic supply. Ah, okay. So when the narcissist hits rock bottom, okay. he wants to become self-sufficient. Ironically, it is the narcissist's grandiosity that is the main ally of the therapist. Oh, right. Okay. Because the therapist says to the narcissist, listen, I have a therapy for you. And after this therapy, you're not going to need anyone for narcissistic supply. You're going to be really, really autonomous and independent and strong. Because now you are dependent. Now you're an addict. You're a junkie. You need narcissistic supply. So you are dependent on people. It's humiliating. It's shameful. I'm going to take away this shame from you. I'm going to render you. I'm going to render you fully self-sufficient. Because from after the therapy, you're not going to need supply anymore. So it's like a junkie. Why do why do junkies come to rehab? I used yeah, to work, why? That's the question. I used to work in rehab. They come to rehab because of the humiliation. If you talk to junkies in rehab, and I worked in rehabs for 10 years, if you talk to them, the main motivation is shame. The main is shame. Okay. The things they were forced to do in order to obtain drugs, okay. the boundaries they broke, the betrayal, how they betrayed people they loved, you know, the things they did 
which were criminal and violated their own values. So they're they're terribly ashamed. Shame is yes. the core, shame is the core of narcissism. Yes. As well. As, so, as I heard from you. Wait a second. So if they're so ashamed, how can they trust you that you will deliver? Because they're they're paranoid, as you said. You know, they have paranoid ideas and all this. Why should they trust someone to help him even? Because uh, because the cold therapist does not pretend to be the narcissist friend. Okay, okay. Other In other treatment modalities, okay. the therapist says, okay. I'm on your side. I'm your That's ally. Right. I'm your friend. And this provokes paranoid ideation. <laughs> the narcissist says, why what's in it for him why is he doing this <laughs> this is manipulation he wants something from me narcissists are paranoid that's right okay. but if i come to the narcissist and says this is transactional give and take i'm not your friend i don't care about ah. it. i Aha. couldn't care less if you are if you get if you die yes tomorrow the narcissist trusts me he believes ah. me. the boundaries again the yes. boundaries create the good thing trust. the outcome they trust the trust Narcissists, boundaries. Trust, narcissists trust people who are like them. The narcissist is like that. The okay. narcissist is nobody's friend, nobody's ally, right, right, not right. a good person. So when he comes across a therapist who is the same, not his friend, uh -huh. not his ally, not pretending. Okay. All right. That's, a, that's the point I missed. I missed. Then the narcissist trusts someone like that because he can understand Someone like understand that. the brain, the brain yes. thoughts, the, the brain. He said, I'm like that. So I understand this guy. There won't be nasty surprises down the road because I know how to, to work with this guy. This guy is interested only in, in results. He doesn't care about me. He's not my friend. He's not my ally. He's not my family member. He's oh, not, you know. see. But in all other therapies, all other therapies, even if you go to yes. CBT, CBT, cognitive yes. behavior therapy, yes. I don't positive therapy, transactional analysis, EMDR, in all other types of therapies, yes. the therapist strikes with you a therapeutic alliance. There is an, a contract, an agreement between the two of you. You are partners. You're working together. That's right. Right. Narcissists don't right. have partners. That's why it failed. Wait, now I understand why they don't come back. Narcissists don't I'm have partners. Offended. I'm too for them. When... I'm helping. I'm for them. I want to improve. Yeah. Okay. Wrong message. Wrong, wrong, message wrong. Wait a second. Wait a second. There's another thing. If you want to, if you, if yes. you, if you come and say to me, I'm an awesome. If you come and say to me, listen, I'll be your therapist. We need to make a therapeutic alliance. We need to make an agreement, a contract on how to proceed. And I want to help you. I'm saying to me, and we, and we are partners. It's a partnership. I'm saying to myself, who are you to be my partner? We don't and say the do words, think? but we still, we, we, we. Yeah. And why like do you think no, in, many, in many cases you say it in words? Therapeutic alliance I don't, I don't, is verbalized. I don't. Yeah. I don't. So tough it, love. I, I like I like the tough love, and you mentioned tough love yourself. So it is a sort of like a tough love from the 70s. No love, no love. Forget the word love. It's tough. It's tough, tough it's, what? It's goal oriented. It's psychopathic. Mm -hmm. it's, it's exactly tough love. It's a it, narcissist language. It's exactly the narcissist language. Focus on goals. Okay. Forget emotions. Focus on goals. Okay. okay, I like it. I like it very much. So, a little bit uh, hope. A little bit hope. Some hope. You are very fixated on hope. Yeah, because I don't have hope right now. No, no, the clients are gone to the war. You know, Sam is is Sam is the only hope right now. Um, but what I'm saying, because you know, we 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 live in a in a tough uh, world, but it's interesting. I have to ask you two questions. I don't want to embarrass you, but I'm sure that you will not be embarrassed because you know how to deal if with it's about If it's about my private life, I'd rather... No, no, no. <laughs> the, um, what is your take about 12 steps? I don't know if you wrote, wrote about it or talked about it because I'm, yeah. I'm, new to, I'm new to this. What about 12 steps? No money? It's, no it's, money. Like, it's like the question you asked me about brief therapy. Okay. Depends. You can't generalize. Okay. It fits. It fits some patients and so on. It All has right. great results with some patients and doesn't others. Doesn't fit others. There's no size, one size fits all. You know? That's for sure. That's for sure. So That's some sure. some addicts um, 
are well built, are exactly built for a 12 step program because they lack discipline, they lack boundaries. They don't have, they don't have, they're grandiose. They don't have an internal, internal, uh, they don't have internal regulation that is regulated and so on. So there is this prison like imposition of a framework with steps, with structure, with order, with goals, which are very clear, well defined. And it fits perfectly this kind of patient. And other kinds of patients, it doesn't fit. So dialectical behavior therapy, for example, yes. uh, also has techniques that are very reminiscent of 12 steps. That's right. And and DBT is also fits one type of patient, the borderline. But yes. if you try DBT with narcissists, it would be a disaster. If you try DBT with psychopaths, if you try DBT with, you know, you need to tailor, you need to customize the treatment to the patient. Luckily, you know what? I have to mention her name. Her name is the Dr. Danielle Knafo. She's in New York. She's a psychoanalyst. I'm not a psychoanalyst, but what I like about her and maybe people should know about her, she, she has a book and uh, she believes that we are all in an age of perversion, which is okay. <laughs> we are all in this world of perversion making love to uh, Japanese dolls, you name it. And she's okay with it when I'm shocked because what else, I, what's next? It's okay to have, to make love to uh, Japanese dolls To And she, of course, Jewish, like both of us. And uh, she believes that you, like you said, you have to talk to a person where he is with boundaries. The boundaries, I don't know, but she does believe to talk to every person, and I believe it too, to where, wherever he is. If he is in 12 steps and he likes God, fine. He likes dolls, fine. As, and I like it. It's very, um, it's very optimistic, and I, I recommend that uh, we all know about uh, Dr. Daniel Knafo. And uh, I want to thank you. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we talk. Uh, what else did we want you to ask talk me, about? You asked me two additional questions. If you want, I will answer them. Yes. No, I'd like to. I'd like you to. You asked me, what can we expect from therapy? Oh, Renga, Rakshnia, I have to have some drink. Wait a second. Just a second. Okay, uh, I ordered some drink, some um, juice. Um, what is the... You asked yeah, me two questions that we, we didn't tackle. So I, I can answer these questions if you wish. I like it. I'm sure I love it. I love it. I love it. So ask me, what can we expect from therapy? I think all therapies, regardless of, of the modality, all therapies should focus on four things. To provide the patient with insight, new way of looking at himself or herself, their lives, their history, personal history, and so on. Insight. The aha moment, the light bulb moment, moment. You know, The second thing is problem solving. I think therapy should be focused on solving problems. It should not be an intellectual exercise. That is why I'm seriously against psychoanalysis. You know, it's too intellectual. It's not, right. it's not problem oriented. That's right. But number three, Therapy should be transformative. It should induce change. And number four, therapy should include self-acceptance or even self-love. So this is where uh, Knafo, I don't know Knafo's work, but this is where we agree that if you want the patient to accept themselves and to love themselves, then you must meet the patient. You must, you must go to the patient, not bring the patient to you. Because if you bring the patient to your point of view, to your values, to your beliefs, to your, then the patient is no longer the same person and they cannot love themselves. They cannot accept themselves. This is bad practice. You should not, you should induce transformation, but this transformation should be controlled and managed by the patient, not imposed by the therapist, never. The, the patient is not your raw material. It's not raw material. It's not you're not making a sculpture. It's not Pygmalion. You know, the patient is is there, and you are you are supposed to help the patient, not to create the patient or generate the patient. So the godlike attitude of some therapists mm -hmm. and some treatment modalities, and 
for example, psychoanalysis. This godlike attitude, I know much better than you, I know more about you than you do, and I'm going to tell you how you should be. I don't like that. It's counterproductive, even destructive, I would say. So this, this is my view of... Uh, I agree, of course. Uh, I'm quite amazed that psychoanalysis is still in... in, uh, in... But what she did, it's okay. She did the, she she injected it with um, a lot of um, a lot of real work in that uh, people are people. We should we should uh, help them with boundaries and um, with without uh, without them being too intellectual. By the way, you don't have to laugh at intellectuals. You are very much an intellectual, and I think mm -hmm. uh, in this in this hour, I wanted you to be. Uh, what fun that you are, and and it's funny, and it's fun, and it's great because Thank less you. less intellectual. So, and the last question, in... last question you asked me is about can narcissistic yes. traits subside with maturity? That's right. And you said you. I know your answer, but mm -hmm. I know your answer also is very in, interesting because it has two parts, two some parts, not well, all of them. There are nine. There are nine clinical features of narcissism. Nine, what we call trait domains of narcissism. So okay. Number one is lack of empathy. Lack, lack of, of empathy is not unique to narcissism. We have it in psychopathy, for example. We have it even in borderline to some extent. Lack of empathy. Number two is fear of intimacy and insecure attachment style. Number three, disturbed identity, diffuse identity. There's no self. Narcissism is a disturbance or disruption in the formation of the self in early childhood. Number four, attention-seeking behavior. Number five, grandiosity. It's a cognitive distortion. It's a misperception of reality. Grandiosity is, again, not common only to narcissism, but it's typical of psychopaths and borderlines and, and bipolars and paranoids and many others. Mm -hmm. and, um, and next thing is anankestia. Anankestia is fancy name for obsessive compulsive behavior. Negative affectivity. Negative affectivity means negative emotions, not positive emotions, only negative emotions like envy, anger, hatred, and so on. And because the narcissist is full with negativity, he's very fragile. Number, uh, number eight is dissociality, antisocial behavior, sometimes even criminal. And the last point is antagonism, seeking conflict, being obnoxious, all the time fighting, all the time arguing, never pleasant. So antagonism. Now, of all these nine, only two change with age, and that is dissociality and antagonism. Narcissists mellow only in these two. It is not true that narcissists become more empathic. That's interesting. Age. Can Not you say really. more about it? Sorry? Can you say more about the empathy thing? Because it's hard to believe like a person who has grandchildren in the age of 70, whereas, you know, how can he not be more empathic when I, you know... More... Empathy is not a function of who you are surrounded with. I know, I empathy, know, but still... Empathy is pretty, pretty determined by the time you're 18. It's, again, nonsense to say that you can learn empathy. Or develop empathy. Okay. This is self-interested, self-enriching nonsense. So the I understand. Industry. I but, understand. but so I wanted you believe, to repeat it because it's important. So empathy. Believe, I have to disturb you right, just a second. Empathy is really developed on the age of eighteen in your even much earlier. A, a wow. part, there are three types of empathy. You have reflexive empathy. You have okay. cognitive empathy, and you have emotional empathy. The reflexive part you are born with. That's why okay. babies smile when mommy smiles. That's a reflexive empathy. Yes. Then you gradually until age four, you develop cognitive empathy. You you see someone crying and you say, she is crying. That's kind of cognitive empathy. She's crying, she's sad. That's cognitive empathy. And then you have emotional empathy. She's crying, she's sad. This makes me sad. So... Um, Cognitive empathy is finished by age four. Emotional empathy, usually by age 12, definitely by age 18. There's no possibility to make any difference in terms of the status of empathy. Either you have it or you don't. Now, wow. narcissists, narcissists and psychopaths and so on, they have what I call 
cold empathy. I love cold things, cold things. Yeah, I know. Therapy, cold empathy. I cold know empathy too. is simply reflexive and cognitive empathy without emotional empathy. So, but narcissists do change. For for example, they become less antagonistic. Okay. They become less con less conflict prone, less conflicting. They become much more social, pro-social. 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 So they become less antisocial. And because the exact same process happens with psychopaths, psychopaths also become less antagonistic and more pro-social. And because we know that psychopathy is a brain disorder with a very pronounced genetic hereditary component, we are beginning to think that narcissism is also some kind of brain abnormality with a genetic component, although we have no proof of this. It's just speculation. And the speculation is because both psychopaths and narcissists go through the same trajectory. They change in the same way across the lifespan until at the very end of life, they are indistinguishable from each other. They become more or less the same. And so if one of them is, is genetic and medical and biological, probably the other one also. And we know that borderline is definitely hereditary and definitely biological. We know this. Mm -hmm. And they are all in the same family, plus the B, mm -hmm. personality disorders. So while we have no proof at this stage, no rigorous proof, no serious proof of brain abnormalities in narcissists, there are studies here, there, nothing serious. And definitely we have no proof of any genetic component or predisposition. I think it's very, very likely that narcissism involves damage to the brain. Maybe the brain is normal at the beginning, but the abuse and the trauma damage the brain some way. Neuroplasticity. And I also believe that there is a genetic predisposition because you take 10 children, they're all abused. Only one of them becomes narcissist. Exactly. It must be something there, some template, some predisposition, which mm -hmm. can only be genetic. No. I think you are uh, you gave me some optimism uh, to deal with uh, tonight because it was very interesting. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I think uh, we talked so little about your work and I'd like to maybe in the future uh, talk to you again uh, when there's results that you can talk about. And uh, I wish you, um, wow, health. And I thank you so much. For and I wish you, and and I wish you safety. It's, uh, it was really amazing. Thank you so much. Keep, keep safe. I, I, I will, I will see you on, on YouTube. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Bye-bye.